Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see so many of you here. I'm Anne Marie Stock, and I have the privilege of working as the presidential liaison for strategic cultural partnerships. In doing so, I work closely with President Catherine Rowe at William and Mary and President Cliff Fleet at Colonial Williamsburg. So it's really a pleasure to welcome so many of you here tonight. We've had more than 100 people register for this conversation, this meet and greet, which is extraordinary. And I think really attests to the interest in the Williamsburg Bray School project um, and the William and Mary Bray School lab. I'm seeing among those in attendance, people from across William and Mary and Colonial Williamsburg, as well as in our greater Williamsburg community, some volunteers and um, some donors, partners, other friends. So a warm welcome to all of you and especially warm welcome to the members of the Bray School Board and the Bray School Advisory Council. We're just really grateful for your service and for your efforts to bring us thus far. So at this stage, I am going to just say you are so welcome here. We're grateful for your presence, your interest. We're thrilled with the momentum around the Bray School, and I will turn things over to Margaret Morrison. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Margaret Morrison, um, Administrative Coordinator for Anne Marie and the Office of Strategic Cultural Partnerships. Um, so I support the various projects and programs that fall under the SCP umbrella, uh, which includes the Bray School Lab. Uh, most of what I do for the lab is logistical work to support the initiatives my colleagues will be sharing with you tonight. Um, so I do things like web design, procurement, budget and personnel transactions, and uh, setting up events like this one. So I'm so happy to be here, so happy to see that number of uh, logged in participants just ticking up, 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 up. Um, I think it's going to be a great night. So welcome and thank you. Let me also add my welcome to uh, those from Anne Marie and Margaret. My name is Maureen Elgersman Lee. I am the director of the Bray School Lab. And uh, I think the only thing that would be better than having um, this conversation that we're going to have tonight um, with as many participants as we have registered, doing it over Zoom. Um, the only thing better would, of course, be doing this in person. So we look forward to when we can have more events um, in person, but we didn't want to lose the momentum that we've been gaining. And um, so we're taking it, of course, virtually for now, and we look forward to um, events in the future. And I'm going to pass it on to Nicole. Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to see you here this evening. Um, my name is Nicole Brown. I am the lab assistant for the Bray School Lab, so working very closely with our student thought partners. Any of you who are here this evening, welcome, as well as our volunteer thought partners, also welcome. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of work on the ground with processing some of our immediate projects, which we'll be talking about this evening. So really excited to have you here. In order to get us started, actually, I have been asked to give us just a brief overview of the history of the Williamsburg Bray School. Um, so Margaret, would you mind moving to the next slide? So the, the photograph that you're seeing on the screen is from the early 1920s. It's a photograph of what is known by some as the Diggs Building, the Bray Diggs Building, or the Bray Diggs Shields Building, lots of different titles. But ultimately, the Williamsburg Bray School was funded between 1760 and 1774 by the associates of Dr. Bray. They were one of the largest charities in Virginia's colonial established church, the Church of England. They also were the first official school for African Americans, both free and enslaved, teaching somewhere between 300 and 400 students over its 14 year duration. So the Bray School has this very complex relationship with religion, education, and slavery in colonial America, but also understanding the lived experiences of the teacher, Mrs. Wager, Ann Wager, and the students themselves speak to this complex relationship. And it's one of the things 
that the lab is doing some extensive research on and will continue to do, which is holistically looking at the multiplicity of perspectives and voices involved in this very early colonial school dedicated to Black education. So that genesis really is what leads us to being here this evening because the photograph you see in front of you is a building that is actually still extant. It was hidden under some 19th and 20th century layers, but ultimately in 2021, Colonial Williamsburg and William and Mary in partnership announced the Bray School Initiative of which the Bray School Lab is part of this. And the Bray School Lab really is promoting the academic and scholastic research on the rediscovery of the original Williamsburg Bray School. So that hope gives you a brief overview of the Bray School itself and to some degree how and why our lab ended up coming into the genesis it does now. Um, but I'm going to pass it off to Maureen to talk a little bit more about the lab in its entirety. Do we go to the next slide, um, Margaret? I'm staying on this one. All right, so the Bray School Lab. And again, first of all, thank you, Nicole. Nicole is. Um, a accomplished but also at the same time rising scholar extraordinaire and we are so very pleased and privileged to have her um, on our what we call like what i call our core team um, of the bray school lab so thank you um, for that nicole um, i just want to step back for a minute and just um talk just give kind of overview for tonight we we welcomed you and um for those who are not familiar with the Bray School history, we've got a little bit of that snapshot given by Nicole. But um, the evening is going to be um, moving through these slides with various pieces of information about what we're doing, the projects, and so on. But we're going to reserve a, a good amount of time for what we hope is a robust conversation, asking you to, or, to, or really inviting you to ask questions. Um, just to really be engaged in in really you know thinking about um the bray school lab thinking about the bray school community connections and so on so we hope that we will really kind of engender that that passion for what we're very passionate about um this evening but the bray school lab is the home of research um concerning the bray school at will and mary it is part of the williamsburg bray school initiative um, that was announced last year as a partnership, formal partnership between William and Mary and Colonial Williamsburg. And that initiative really exemplifies something that we like to talk about at the Bray School Lab, and that's stories and structure. So we like to think about the Bray School Lab on the William and Mary side being very much about discovering, expanding, exploring, delving deep into the stories of the Bray School. So the school itself, its students, um, the individuals who sent students there, um, descendants of the original Bray School students. We know of 88 students by name, um, whose names are recorded across, across three student lists that survive. Um, we hope to find more, and we'll talk about those um, shortly when we talk about projects. But that's the story side. And the structure is the way we like to think about the Colonial Williamsburg side experts in studying um, and restoring and preserving colonial architecture. And of course, the two come together and we, we overlap and we complement each other. And it's the stories and structure. And that ampersand is the glue, uh, I think, that really holds us all together under the initiative, um, in our day-to-day -day interactions, and certainly in the spirit of scholarship and advancing what is just an amazing history um, in colonial Williamsburg and, and larger colonial America. So I just wanted to, to kind of set the stage that way. Um, we are interdisciplinary. I like to think about us as being ultimately this 360 degree interdisciplinary um, research platform for investigating the history and legacies of the Bray School and its students. And the picture you see is Travis House. That is the physical home of the lab. And um, some of you may recognize where that is on the corner of Henry and uh, Francis Streets. But we are so privileged to occupy that space um, where we have our offices and we have um, the actual physical lab where we welcome um, students and where we um, are welcoming partners at CW 
And again, the partnership just continues to grow almost, almost on a weekly basis. We are connecting with partners here and in, um, in Richmond and across Hampton Roads, and it's just expanding, expanding. So um, every day coming to work is a pleasure. And we also never know how each day is gonna go. Um, opportunities that come up and um, just change the, uh, the trajectory of our day and just enrich our days greatly. And today was one of those days. Um, as well as Anne-Marie can attest to. Um, so we're really about uncovering the Brave School's history and charting a path forward. And we really want to be um, transparent and just welcoming to individuals. Um, and we're gonna talk about that theme that's gonna run through the evening. We want you to be part of this lab. It is the William and Mary Brave School Lab. It, it, it's, it's um, you know, if you look at staffing and so on, we're William and Mary. But as I was saying in a different conversation earlier today, we can't do this work without partners. We absolutely cannot do the work that we are um, charging ourselves with doing without partners. And those partners exist in the community, Colonial Williamsburg and other great partners, Alejandro, um, First Baptist, um, under the umbrella of um, Strategic Cultural Partnerships, the Lemon Project, and all our great partners. So they exist uh, in the community and also across the campus, uh, across schools, across departments, um, whether it's faculty, staff, students, whether undergraduate, graduate, everyone is part of the lab. So we really want people to see this lab, the Bray School Lab, as your lab and as a lab that um, you feel that you can connect with. And we invite you to be partners um, in various ways in the years as in the years coming, because we've got a lot of work to do. It's not going to be done in the next few weeks. So um, this is a this is a long road ahead and we have to go together. So next slide. So this is a picture from um, inside Travis House, one of our candid shots. I think this was courtesy of Nicole. I think this is your shot. Um, so meeting with student partners. So we have two major projects that are that we have launched. Um, the first is the school records project. And here in this particular meeting, we're talking about um, transcription and bringing students in as thought partners and, and collaborators in getting key documents related to the history of the Williamsburg Bray School um, transcribed. Um, edited to some degree, annotated, um, and just really enriched, and then um, uploading them so that they can be available to the public. The lab's um, challenge, but also its opportunity, is that the lab does not have a specific archive of its own. We don't have a, a, a library or, or a vault or anything of that nature of documents that are solely ours. So we are creating a digital archive, and we have that challenge, but we also have the opportunity to create one that's very much curated to the history of the Williamsburg Bray School, contextualized by the history of other Bray schools in Virginia, both those that were successful. Um, so we think of Fredericksburg, for example, but also others that never came into being um, and the whole, um, the planning for those schools did not get off the ground. There was opposition. So really looking at why and how Bray schools in Virginia were successful and also why they were not, because that's part of the story as well. We want to frame it out further in the context of other Bray schools in the colonial United States. And then finally, the diaspora, because this really is, at the end of the day, a story of diaspora, wherein there were Bray schools in Canada and also in the British colonized Caribbean. And we're gonna mine those sources for what those sources can tell us about Williamsburg. So everything comes back to Williamsburg, even as we are looking outside of Williamsburg and outside of Virginia. So the transcription project is the first stage of the records project. We will go into other collections um, very methodically so that we are very clear about the path that we're going forward and where we've been. We'll look at other collections in SWIM and in other places, Rockefeller Library. We are going to eventually have to travel um, and look at other um, important collections in the United States, for example, and really just mine that for whatever else it can tell us about 
the, um, the Gray School, we are very much hoping to find new student lists and more information about students. And that's a great segue to the second project, which is the Student History Project. I think for a lot of people, this is the heart and soul of the Gray School Lab. Who were the students? Who were those 88? Um, where can we hopefully find others um, um, among those who went to school um, somewhere in that 14 year time period that Nicole was talking about? What do we know about them as students? What do we know about their lives? Can we find them in the records? Can we trace them in the records? And the goal ultimately is to create as many robust um, biographies of these children, including um, genealogical lines, hopefully to the present day. So as I said, we've got a lot of work ahead of us and um, we want to partner with you. Um, as Emma said, we have we can go together um, on this path. We make the path as we go together. Um, so next slide, Ms. Margaret. So on this topic, obviously, we're looking at documents from our past in Williamsburg, but the past is linked like a chain. Um, I've said this many times, and I will continue to say it to our present and our future, which is why descendant and community based approach is a really key part of our lab. So in the spirit of full transparency, we want to make sure that you are aware that we are using the best practices for descendant engagement based on the 2018 rubric from the National Summit on Teaching Slavery that was held at Montpelier. So we're looking at that rubric both in saying how should we be engaging descendant communities as well as inviting in individuals from the descendant community and multiple communities across Williamsburg. We also want to make it very clear that if you know yourself to be a descendant of a Bray School student or you think you might be or you have questions, we are here to make sure that you are supported and that you are served. You can always reach us at our Bray School Lab email, and before we leave tonight, we'll make sure you get that email. Um, but mostly, we want you to know that we're here to support you, and we're here to connect those documents and those projects that Maureen just mentioned to our present, because the reality is that our past informs our present and it informs our communities that we live in now in Williamsburg, and the ramifications still felt therein. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about sort of the genesis of the two projects Maureen mentioned later on, i.e. how we're actually going to be tackling the student record or pardon me, the Bray School Records Project and the Student History Project. But we just wanted to make it very clear that, you know, we have a descendant and community based approach. And if you'd like to refer to the descendant engagement document that I just mentioned, if you go to research and engagement under the Bray School Lab web page, there's an entire section there specifically for descendants and the descendant approach that we're trying to take with our best practices. So um, Margaret, can you go to the next slide? So today was a great day. Um, it's a it's a special day We're you know, two, 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 um, two. Some of the twos in there. Um, so it's been a fun kind of day, but today was also um, a fun day because we launched uh, this afternoon the Brace School Lab blog. So it's called A Reasonable Progress. Um, and you might wonder why we're calling that, calling it that. Well, a reasonable progress is drawn from the primary document. So in thinking about the blog, and, and we've been talking about this. So even though for many, in many ways, the the lab is becoming visible as of late. There has been a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of planning, um, partnering and so on behind the scenes that have led us to this point to today with the, with the meet and greet and some other great things that have already happened this week. And it's really only Tuesday. So one of them is launching the, is the blog. So a reasonable progress comes from one of the letters, one of the primary documents related to the history of the Bray School. It's a 1765 letter from Robert uh, Carter Nicholas, who was one of the trustees of the Bray School, um, to the um, Bray Associates in London. And in addition to being um, a graduate of William & Mary, member of the House of Burgesses, um, trustee, Nicholas was an incredible writer and he was very prolific. So we see his voice and his writing frequently uh, in documents related to 
the uh, Bray School. But in, in December of 1765, he pens this letter um, to, to England, where the um, Bray Associates were based in London. And he's talking about the status of the school and he's giving a report. And he says that he has examined of late um, you know, the school and the children, and he found that the children have made um, a reasonable progress. And well, what does that mean? Right? What was this reasonable progress? Is that is that um, is that a conservative assessment? Is it laudatory? Um, so we're doing a lot of ultimately doing a lot of interpretation, but I wanted something that links us to the primary documents um, and grounds us in this evidence based research, which we hold up as a as important um, pillar of the work that we do at Will Mary across the campus, of course. Um, and just use it as this in, but use it as a way to think about and, and center uh, the progress of the children and the children in the story of the lab, um, of the school rather. So the Bray School Lab is focused very much on illuminating the history of the children. Um, with the story comes through primary documents who are not written by the children. So we know that there is a filter. And so how do we deal with that? Uh, it just opens up various questions and it, it, it represents the things that we plan to tease out um, over the coming um, months and really coming years. So we had um, our quiet launch, our soft launch. So this is kind of the first public time we're talking about it. And um, the, the blog will be authored by various individuals. So myself as director, I'm just kind of setting the stage for what's coming. We'll talk about the projects, we'll talk about findings, so it's content, but it's also process. So the what and the where and the when and the whys um, in as much as research tells us and, and our investigation of that tells us, but also the how, right? I like to say, we're gonna talk about how we lab in the Bray School Lab. So processes and um, other things of that nature. So we welcome you to um, on the on the um, Bray School um, webpage. You'll see on the right hand side um, the information about the blog, and we'll be up. We'll be adding new posts on a regular basis. I think Nicole, you are up for um, the next one. So we know that will be both exciting and engaging and thorough because Nicole is anything. You know, she's she's thorough regardless of um, the context of subject matter. Um, so we're so we're looking forward to that. But we also are going to be opening it up as well as in the spirit of the lab in general. So while staff will be writing, we'll be inviting students to write for the blog, um, Will and Mary faculty, staff to write for the blog, uh, members of the descendant community, we want to have your voices as well. Um, anyone, anyone who is interested, who is a stakeholder, which is a very, very large number of people um, in the history of the Bray School and in the Bray School Lab, we invite you to partner with us. So if you have an idea, if you, if this sets something in motion for you, for an idea, and you even want to start drafting, um, we invite you to go ahead and do that. And we also, again, invite you um, to reach out so that we know, and we will look for um, a place for you on I don't say so much the schedule. I mean, we have a map, but we're, I'm learning to be flexible. So I like to have tables and I like to have schedules, but I'm learning very much to be flexible. And because we are discovering things um, in the documents, we have fresh um, thinkers as thought partners and our students, they have different perspective ideas and so on. And we want to capture those and we want to share them and as, you know, as close to real time as we can. So we're really excited about this, and um, I just invite you to, to read the introductory blog called the Reasonable Progress Setting the Stage and look for more to come. Um, none of this could be possible as we're seeing the fruit of our labors really come to fruition, public, come to the public eye. We could not do this work without our donors. So we've mentioned the, um, the Bray School Initiative, immense partnership and, and such incredible goodwill. I'm going to talk about that goodwill at the end of our um, session when we get closer to 730. 
and the staff knows what we're talking about there. But incredible, um, genuine partnership, goodwill um, has been there from day one. And so we have that partnership, but specifically at the level of the lab, we could not do this work without an incredible donor. Um, and his name is Steve Colhagen. And so again, that's the foundation on which we stand. And from there, we can only go up. But I have to recognize um, that gift. And we had the pleasure of meeting Steve in person um, last fall and really um, getting to know the man as well as the donor. And um, so I just want to bring that to light. But in addition, all right, again, I said it's already Tuesday, but we've had a full week already in, in terms of um, developments. And you may have seen over the weekend um, news that the Mellon, Andrew Mellon Foundation, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has awarded a $5 million grant to the project. And that is to um, the Williamsburg um, Grade School Initiative Partnership with money for um, the majority of the money going to um, Colonial Williamsburg for restoration and also money for um, William and Mary on the um, Grace School Lab side to advance um, the goals of the project. And I'm going to invite Anne Marie, I know as presidential liaison, um, we'll want to say more about that. Happy to. We are just elated by this great news. I want to acknowledge that Steve Colhagen is with us tonight. He and his wife, Gail, really were visionary in getting this project off the blocks. They came to us early on asking how they could help, and they've helped in myriad ways, including with their vision, including with their affirmation, and just underscoring that this mattered not just for William and Mary, William and Mary and Colonial Williamsburg or our community, but this really mattered for our nation. This was a way for us to have a much more complex understanding of our nation's origin story and a way to have more people see themselves represented in that. That gift was also huge in launching us into this melon um, arena and it's through partnership that we were able to garner what is an exceedingly large gift for Mellon. We are, I think, the flagship of their monuments initiative, and it took great collaboration between Colonial Williamsburg and William and Mary. So we're very committed to keeping that going and um, energized to see so many Colonial Williamsburg colleagues and specialists with us tonight. We want to give one more shout out. I know there are so many of you who could be shouted out, and so I'm reluctant to leave anyone out, but all of us are also aware that Dr. Terry Myers, Professor Emeritus of English at William & Mary, also worked very deliberately, very carefully for many years to help identify um, the history of the location of the structure. So we're indebted to him and grateful that he continues to remain connected as a member of the Bray School Advisory Council. Thanks all around. Back to you, Maureen. Thanks, Anne Marie. There's a, there's a saying um, that we often hear that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And we really do stand on the, on the shoulders of giants in the Bray School Lab. Um, with our donors, and again, and thank you, Emory, for recognizing Terry. Um, for those whose scholarship, whose years of kind of undaunting looking and, and searching and hoping to find and put together the clues that lead us to this point in terms of having a lab, having initiative, and and, and knowing exactly where the original um Bray School building stands now on Prince, you know, on Prince George Street, hidden within the structure of a larger building. So we do stand on the shoulders of giants and we have a responsibility to carry our work forward with um with diligence, um, but also with the same perseverance and passion and aspiration for those people who have been um, behind us thus far. And I think we're ready for the next slide. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more before we get immediately into the Q&A about the actual nitty gritty of the immediate projects that we're working on. So as Maureen mentioned before, the Bray School Records Project and the Student History Project are two of those first major projects that the lab is going to be working on in the spirit of open access. So before I say anything else, I want to be very, very clear that the research the lab is doing through collaboration, through our uh, leadership staff, through descendant engagement, the purpose of all of these projects is to make it open access and available to the public and available to the descendant community and communities throughout Williamsburg and beyond digitally so that they can also look at documents, look at perspectives around the Williamsburg Bray School, the Bray School Lab and beyond. So when it comes to the Bray School Records Project, records obviously mean lots and lots of different things, oral histories, videography, photography, archaeology, but the first prong, the first approach within what we'll be doing immediately is looking at transcribing all of the documents that the Bray Associates have in their collection, which is housed at the University of Oxford. So I've spent a great deal of time as a graduate student, as well as a lab assistant and working for CW, analyzing these documents. We're going to be following best practices by using um, a software system called Transcribus. So what you're seeing is a screenshot actually from our Transcribus project archive that we'll be working with the student thought partners on. And I do wanna take a minute to thank uh, all of our collaborators to the Georgian Papers Project and the Omahundra Institute who alerted us to this wonderful, wonderful free piece of software. So essentially we're gonna be doing line by line. They're sometimes known as diplomatic transcriptions for all of these documents. There are 19 documents in total in this collection. Editing them, thoroughly vetting them, and including what we call metadata. So for example, cross-referencing people, places and content between the documents so that's more easily searchable in a digital format. That's the first prong of this approach. Uh, as Maureen mentioned, the records project is gonna be broken into stages. You have Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, British North America more broadly and then the diaspora completely. But what we immediately wanna get started on is looking at transcribing all of the documents that are affiliated with the Williamsburg Bray School and making those open access as soon as we realistically can. So we'll keep you updated on that progress, not only through our website, but also through the blog. Margaret, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. And then, of course, as Maureen mentioned, the heart and soul of our immediate projects at the lab is the Student History Project. What you're looking at actually is um, an image of the 1762 Bray School student list, which is the only list to have ages of students on it. I say currently because I am ever hopeful we will find more student lists. And actually that's part of what the history project is about, is not only research, researching the 88 names of students we do have, but looking beyond that to see are there any other students within the archive, within multiple archives beyond, within um, oral history in the descendant community that are affiliated with this school, and then looking at them in relation to the school, but also looking at them beyond that. These are not just names on a list, they're not statistics, they're children, little children, three, four, five, most of them six or seven years old. So looking at their lived experiences, tracing their lives, but tracing them as holistically with respect in relation to their humanity. Um, so the lab is really excited to accomplish this in a variety of different ways. We'll be working with our volunteer thought partners, any community collaborators, and our student thought partners to figure out not only how to do this, but how to do it in a way that is open access. So that may involve student mapping. Uh, mapping, when I say that, I mean it in a medium, a variety of different mediums, right? It can be maps of many different iterations, but ways to think about the students holistically in their lived experiences. It may be delving and it will be into specific archives to look for specific students. But we're going to be working through a lot of some of these um, potential options and opportunities in the next semester to try to more broadly solidify what the student history project will look like moving forward. 
So that is everything I have for the immediate projects. Uh, I'm very honored, as well as I'm sure my other uh, colleagues are, to open up the floor to questions, comments, thoughts. Of course, before the end of the project, we will share um, some of our other wonderful collaborators who are doing some of their own work this evening, and we'll also share our contact information. But I know I can be overly lengthy, and I would prefer to open the floor to all of you to ask questions. So so Margaret, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can either raise your hand using the function in Zoom or putting your comments in the chat box and we will answer them accordingly and Margaret will help us facilitate. Yes, please. Um, whatever you're most comfortable with, feel free to either put it in chat and I can read out to the group or if you raise, if you use the, the raise hand, um, which is just for if anyone's not used that function before, there should be a menu down at the bottom of your screen with a little um, smiley sort of towards the right, a little smiley face with a plus that says reactions. And if you click on that, there should be a button that says raise hand. Um, and if you do that, it should register in the participant list and I'll be able to kind of call on you. Um, but yeah, either either chat or or hand raise. So. So Margaret, while the while the first questions are coming in, I just want to just kind of underscore um, and kind of pull some things together in respect to the fact that we think about the lab as harnessing the transformative power of storytelling. And really that comes through two different channels, um, evidence-based research, but also that stirring of the historical imagination, not, um, not imagining um, outside of what the sources tell us, but being led by the sources and imagining the history and interpretation of the Bray School across disciplines. So also thinking about how can we um, move the story of the Bray School into literary circles, for example, or what do literary conventions and so on tell us about how we can think about and write the history of the Bray School. Um, visual art, I mean, there's so much to be tapped. How can we imagine Bray School students and can we dedicate those imaginings to canvases and theater performances and other things? Um, there's so much to be unpacked here. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that as we start queuing up the questions. Okay, so I've got a question here in the chat. Um, could you include in the blog an account of the current research findings in and about the structure itself? Um, I'd love to, to learn what's going on with the, the research on the structure. Um, would you like me to address that? Because I can talk about it a little bit on the CW and the William and Mary side. So one of the things I will say is if you're interested in learning about the preservation of the structure itself, I highly encourage you to participate in the CW architectural preservation page. They're focusing immediately on the building itself. And of course, we'll address that in our blog with other collaborators. But if you're looking for immediate structural information, they're already beginning to share things on that blog page. And that's because they're dealing with it on the preservation side. So I also want to defer, we also want to defer to them when it comes to building preservation, because that is their area of expertise. That being said, please stay tuned on the blog because you'll see an interdisciplinary approach that will, of course, address the building itself. But if you're looking for more building structural information, that preservation page will keep you updated in real time about what's going on. I would just add to um, what Nicole said. Again, it kind of comes back to the stories and structure balance um, in this larger um, project and partnership. And as much as we um, would love to be in the space all the time, um, watching and so on, we also have to recognize and respect the, the process that Nicole is referencing and also recognize that as the building is being worked on, um, the the building itself becomes less and less um, able to host kind of visitors so we can't always necessarily kind of peer in as much as we want to um, peer in and um, be there on a regular basis because it that can interrupt the process but also um, it's just 
um, doesn't kind of work with the integrity as the integrity of the building changes and the and um, what areas are being worked on shifts so we are we are um, being thoughtful partners in that respect as well um so i've got a request nicole could you drop the uh link to the architectural preservation page you were referencing into the chat um so folks can can get access to that and then uh, another question how are you reaching out and engaging students in um, to participate in this project So right now we are launching what we're considering a pilot project with the lab because we have um, really come back into um, more of the face-to-face -face work of the lab and work on campus fairly recently. It's still February. So you know, last month coming back after um, after holiday, that um, we're working with right now with a, a small core of students and working along the lines of the student records project, some around the student history, um, some other projects as well that are um, of the um, thinking of graduate students who are coming to this from a definitely, definitely coming from a position of having a, a different type of research agenda, um, one that typically is more formed and is longer term over you know, semester to semester um, and project to project. So right now we have a core group of students that we're working with as a pilot, learning um, from them, um, getting feedback in terms of, of what is working for them in terms of the nature of the projects, um, scheduling, um, allotments of time, how much independence versus how much um, tutelage um, they need, particularly um, from Nicole, the lab assistant. Um, and from there, we're going to uh, move out to a broader call for students. That being said, we are not in the position and um, of the mind to turn students away who are interested either. So that's why I'm saying these partnerships are growing um, almost at, at, a, at a weekly rate. So students who are interested in learning about the lab um, for a project in particular that they would like to use for a, a class, um, to be uh, a thought partner for the fall when we all be able to, uh, I think, work with more students. Um, so people can come in and out, if you would, of the lab for different periods of time with and in connection to different projects in the same way that faculty um, will be affiliated with the lab in some way, either because of work that they've already done and would like to connect with the lab or work that they would like to launch in partnership with the lab. So right now we're in pilot phase with a plan to launch out um, in more in a broader sense and um, a more deliberate kind of staging of that um, to be ready for the fall. Maureen, I wonder if I might chime in and Absolutely. introduce Don Edmiston. Don, I'm putting you on the spot, but I think the example that you are developing with your students could be of great interest to folks here. One might not immediately think about students in the Mason School of Business, but thanks to Dawn's creativity um, and her collaborative spirit, we actually have some students doing some really interesting work. Dawn? Sure, sure. It's a delight to be here. It's been such a privilege to work with the Office of Strategic Cultural Partnerships and specifically Maureen and Margaret and Nicole. We've heard so much about you and I'm so looking forward to um, meeting with you personally. And I know that we have a few students who are also on the Zoom call this evening, Brianna, Andrea, Alyssa. So we are very excited. So we have two teams that are working with Maureen to better understand, as she had said, the storytelling and the structure. Um, as a marketing professor at William & Mary, I live for good storytelling and there is no better story to tell than this one of the Brace School and what we are doing in the Brace School Lab. So our hope is to allow students to start to understand as well the importance of services marketing 
and building a marketing strategy using what we could consider to be a new product and affect the Brace School Lab and programs and offerings uh, that they're having. And so um, we've just started the initiative. Um, we're very excited to be involved, um, excited to learn further about the program and the people involved this evening. Uh, so for all of you who have contributed to the project, know that your impact, um, you're having a far greater impact than just uh, the William and Mary community and uh, Williamsburg, but you're impacting directly our students and the students in the School of Business. And for that, I am very grateful. I will also say to this point, just so that everyone is aware, the Bray School Lab is vertically structured. So what I mean by that is that the students have as much a stake, whether graduate or undergraduate in the work, as anyone on the leadership team who's here this evening. Um, and I can say that knowing that I'm going to be working directly very, very much on a day to day basis with the students on their projects immediately. Actually, that's the majority of my week this week. But if you are a student and you're interested or you know a student who might be interested, please reach out to us. Again, we're doing a pilot project this semester, but we have set up a protocol um, and application for people to students to submit, although we welcome all to participate in that. Um, additionally, I also saw that Georgiana mentioned you, that you and your husband lived at the Bray Diggs building for a period of time, and you said that has no significance, but it certainly does. So if you're a community member who has some kind of affiliation with the building or photographs of it or an experience, please reach out to the lab email. We would love to talk to you. In the same way that we're talking about the students and their engagement and that it's a vertical structure, community members are also part of that structure. So please reach out. Um, we'd really love to talk to you. Georgiana, could I invite you to say anything that you might want to say about that experience? I think you're muted. Yeah, there we go. It was just, it was so much fun and my children were uh, toddlers and, and one baby and two toddlers when we lived there in sorority court and you know it was just I was so excited when I read about this several years ago because we lived there for uh, you know in that addition off to the left when you're facing it and um, so it was just exciting for us to you know have lived there for a while you know knowing the history now. I think that's an opportunity to capture um, some information because, you know, the experience that you had there, but I think also um, how you think about those experiences now, knowing more about the history of the building. I think that's wonderful. I, I'm sure I have lots of pictures. That's wonderful. So I'll be in touch. Okay, Thanks. we look forward, we'd love to do Thank that. You. Thank you. Let me also invite Jack Gary from Colonial Woundsburg. Um, I know you're here tonight. Uh, if I'm not putting you on the spot too much, um, can I ask Jack to say anything he would like to say about the structure? Evening, everybody. Sorry, I had my camera off there. Great to see her. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, so the structure, um, our, as, as Nicole said, our architectural preservation team is working their tails off right now to peel back the layers on the inside of the structure. Uh, and really is exposing a building that is amazingly intact from the 1760s. The, the original structure is there, which is just, just awesome. Um, you know, another part of the project from the Colonial Williamsburg side has been the archaeology, and we've already done a considerable amount of, amount of archaeology on the original site uh, where the, the building originally sat, where Brown Dormitory is today. And uh, with any luck, we'll get back and do a little bit more to help to flesh out that story that the um, that the archaeology is telling us not only about the structure but also about the lives of the students uh, that were that were were there, um, and that's that's a tricky thing. We're looking at a time period of five years at that one spot, but you know what? I think we can do it. So, <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, we are thrilled to be part of this project, and um, if anyone has any questions about the archaeology portion of it, feel free to reach out to me here at Colonial Williamsburg. But uh, thanks for inviting me to to say a few words, Maureen. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. And actually remind us to remind everyone that while we talk about the Bray School in a general sense, the Bray School had different iterations. So we know that the, that the extant building um, was the building for five years. 
So we have to kind of temper our, our, our conversation or our language to think about the grade school kind of two ways at once. Grade school as a 14 year institution, but also as specific structure that um, serves students for a specific time being that first five years, and then um, that there were subsequent locations um, for that. So thanks also for bringing that back um, to mind. Next question or raised hand. I was say, Maureen, if I can jump in yeah. first, I've got one question in chat and then a raised hand. Um, so question from chat, have you identified descendants? If so, how are you working with them? Can I, can I talk to this really quickly? So the first thing is, yes, we have identified some descendants or they have identified themselves. I am not going to name them here because they have not given me permission to do so. Um, if they would like to speak, if any of them are here, they are more than welcome to do so. But it's very important to us as a lab that the descendants have autonomy and stake in deciding when they identify themselves in this project. Um, so we have identified some individuals and some individuals have identified themselves, but that list is not exhaustive. It's one of the reasons why we have that descendant page on our research and engagement, um, because we're, we're also hoping um, to serve those communities in the ways they want, in the ways that bring them meaning, much like um, First Baptist and the descendant community is working with that archaeology team at CW to determine what research questions they want asked, how they want to engage. So the answer, um, G, uh, Jan, Janine, I apologize if I've pronounced your name wrong, um, is that yes, we have identified some descendants, but we are nowhere near done. Okay, and then um, Connie, if you want to go ahead and take yourself off mute and uh, go ahead and put that question to the group. Yes, I do. I um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to ask this question. Uh, a lot of discussion about students and student involvement. Um, what has been your experience reaching out to the HBCUs in the area? Because this should be central to their interest when they're studying African American history. The Bray School, I'm thinking, is an overwhelming and compelling story that um, they probably will want to be involved in. Um, so let me talk to that, speak to that for um, a bit. I would say that right now it's been quite general. We are um, in different ways connecting with um, Hampton, which is where I was um, a professor and chair for seven years before coming to William and Mary. Um, Norfolk State um, also have some colleagues um, at Virginia State, particularly in English that are very interested in, um, in the Bray School uh, story and the work of the lab. So there's huge collaboration um, potential most certainly there. Um, and then again, we're thinking about engagement with students um, across different college and university campuses, but also certainly uh, K-12, right? K-12 um, teachers and students also are very much on our radar screen. And, and Nicole, again, with the image, from the, um, the student list reminds us how young these children were. They were young children. And how are the ways in which we might make this story real to children who are now the age of what the, the Bray School children were? How can we make the story come alive for children who are six, seven, eight, nine, ten? 10? Um, but even, even the pre-K, even in the pre-K um, stage, how can we collaborate and think about um, translating the story in a way that they can understand, right, at their level um, without losing um, kind of the potency of the history and the centrality of um, the children um, themselves. So um, this is, again, where we invite um, people to partner with us as much as we are moving forward with our own plans um, as well. So lots of, lots of thinking and, and lots of um, uh, contacts and collaboration there. They just have to be more formalized and then kind of brought to light, as it were. Other questions?
Right, and and um, so Nicole, let's see, let's see yeah, so Nicole has dropped some um, statistics in the chat concerning the, um, the the ages of the students. And again, this is based on the three lists that we have and that have been studied. Uh, if we find more lists, which I hope we will, um, hopefully those lists come with ages. Um, but I think it's only, is it correct, um, Nicole, only one of the three lists actually lists the student ages. So one out of, you know, one year represented out of 14 is, uh, you know, statistically that's not a lot to go on, but it, it's, it's all that we have to go on at this point. Um, Yes, yeah, Nicole. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I will say this is one of the areas where the student history project is going to be so invaluable because some of the other students on the other two lists, we uh, we've already started identifying their potential ages that aren't on those records. So this is where records can also speak to one another. Um, so it's a really exciting opportunity to say we have this one list from 1762 that has student ages, but with more individual specialized and attentive research for each individual student, we may be able to learn more about their ages as well as their lived experience. Um, so we've got, I've got another question here in chat, um, actually, oh, sorry, um, two questions here in chat and then actually a, a valediction from a, a participant who had to go on to another event that I think is going to transfer us into a, a moment that we wanted to take for our colleague right. over at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but let me put these two questions out there. Um, so the first one is, you mentioned that Robert Carter Nicholas was a uh, Williamsburg Bray School trustee. Um, what is his relationship to Robert uh, King Carter and Robert Carter III? Um, and is it known how many other trustees there were? Um, and do we know who they were? Um, Would you like me to answer that? I don't know what face I just made, but I was, I've been living for the past six years to answer that question. Um, <laughs> so yes, Robert Carter Nicholas is the cousin of Robert Carter III. Robert Carter III actually sent one of his enslaved children by the name of Dennis to the school in 1769. Robert King Carter was both of their grandfathers. So Robert Carter Nicholas and Robert Carter III, who both lived in Williamsburg, were affiliated through their grandfather. Um, and Robert King Carter was quite a personality, to make a long story short. When it comes to other trustees, they are very well identified. The initial trustees for the Williamsburg Bray School were William, but ultimately Thomas Dawson, who were um, both presidents at William and Mary, Reverend Yates, who was also a president at William and Mary, and William Hunter, who was the public printer of Virginia. Um, one of the reasons for the turnover of trustees is death. Um, if, if we're being entirely honest, all of those people that I just mentioned were deceased by 1764. They did actually ask Reverend Horrocks at one point, who was the rector of Burton Parish and another president of William and Mary, to serve as a trustee. To our knowledge from the records, he never did, but he did send one of his enslaved individuals by the name of Charlotte to the school, who was likely about six or seven years old when she attended. Um, I hope that answers that question. I also know there was a question of who entered the children in the Bray School. That depends who has control over those children. So if the children um, were affiliated with free Black families, and specifically what I mean by that is either both parents were free or the mother was free, because the status of children is based on the mother, not the father. Um, then those parents would be involved in that process, the Ashby and the Jones family specifically. But in most cases, it was the slave owner who determined not only which students, but what ages and for how long. And for how long is an interesting uh, topic within the history of the Bray School in that um, Robert Carter, Carter Nicholas as a trustee was, I won't say it was inflexible, but he had very clear ideas about how the school was to operate and how students were to gain the benefits of the school. And he wanted each student to go to school for three years. He saw three years as that time that if you're going to send this, these children, you need to be committed to sending them and not having them there for a little while and then having them leave again. So he wanted them to stay for three years, although in his own notes, he, he, he notes that that was not the norm. He himself sent one uh, girl, Hannah, 
to the school and uh, even remarks that he sent her for the three years. So he's, he's leading by example in that sense. And we also get some other ideas about um, expectations of those who are enrolling in essence children in the school. And uh, so I just wanted to add that. How are we doing on time? Should we go to the um, to the last slides? Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say we've got we've got one more Bray specific question, but I thought now would be a good time to um, take a quick quick detour to our CW colleagues, and then we can come back to to finish that out. So give me just a moment here. So our wonderful, wonderful colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg talking about goodwill on all sides, as Maureen mentioned before, actually pushed back this presentation to 730 so that more people could come to this meet and greet. So we highly encourage you to attend virtually the us past, present and future CW conversation on black history. Some wonderful colleagues from my end on the Colonial Williamsburg side will be speaking this evening. And I think it will very much complement. We think it will very much complement the conversation we're having right now. So that starts now. Um, but if you want to stay for questions, please know that a recorded, full recorded version of this past, present, and future will be available on their website to the link that Margaret just dropped in the chat. So let me also add how just very grateful um, we are to our partner, um, Colonel Williamsburg. This, this adjustment that they made was very much um, quite, I would say, almost spontaneous. Um, and just they were all in and making sure that we had what we need to make this evening successful. So we want to thank them and we also want to do our best to make sure that their program is successful um, starting at 730. So for those who had planned to or those who are now plans are extending um, to uh, attend this conversation, we invite you to do that. And um, if you have a question that you would like to ask and, and have some conversation, we will hang on, but um, we will ultimately, I think, also shift and, and, and be present for um, Colonial Williamsburg as well. And also want to make sure that you have our um, contact information, which I think is the last one. So we've been talking about partnerships. We've been talking about collaboration and we want to work with you. So um, the Williamsburg, sorry, the Will and Mary uh, website, the Bray School Lab, even if you just search Bray School Lab, you will get to our lab page. Um, you have our names and our positions, our emails are there. But if, if nothing else, just remember Bray Lab at Will and Mary at WM. So Bray Lab at WM.edu is the email for the lab. Any questions for anyone, any of our, what I call our core staff, our core team um, connected to the lab, it will get to them. It will get to them. We are um, constantly in communication. And, but it's very easy to remember just Bray Lab, B R A Y L A B at wm.edu, and you will, um, you will be reaching us and we will be happy um, to speak with you on whatever topic, whatever aspect of the Gray School that you would like to um, engage in. And of course, the website is um, the Women Mary regular site, wm.edu forward slash sites forward slash Gray School forward slash. So we're pretty easy to find and we are, our presence is growing on the website. And again, even today with the lab um, blog being a new addition to the site. So. Um, we will pivot fairly shortly, but for those who want to stay on, we will continue to uh, field questions. But we want to be good partners to, um, to uh, Colonial Williamsburg in the way that they've been great partners to us um, in planning this. To um, that, oh. go ahead, go ahead, Nicole. To that point, I was actually going to just check with you, Margaret. Um, I saw that Jane had a question about textbook at the Bray School, and I was happy to address that just very quickly. Um, Jane, we do know what kinds of textbooks were used at the school in so much that catalogs of books were sent specifically between 17 
1760 and 1763, and then again in 1771 for the Williamsburg Bray School. Um, but stay tuned, I think that could be a very interesting blog post. So I hope you come back and visit us on our blog because we could talk about that more potentially there. And also Terry Myers has done an extensive amount of research into the texts that were used at this school. So I encourage you to look at his research that's on the Lemon Project page. And also speaking of the Lemon Project, we have to also thank the Lemon Project for, um, for publicizing and, and kind of cross-posting the registration for um, tonight's event. They launched a beautiful blog uh, this week. It's, it, it's, it's only Tuesday, but we've just, it's been a robust, you know, two days already. Um, they have a beautiful, stunning um, blog that will, that's just the aesthetics are absolutely beautiful. And of course, the content um, in true Lemon Project um, fashion um, is engaging and substantive as always. So thank you also to um, the Lemon Project, Sarah, um, Jody, um, Juan, I see you on here. I'm not sure if Maria's here, but just thank you. We just have some of the best partners and we wanna continue to always honor our partners and our partnerships. So thank you again to Lemon Project, but definitely check out that blog, it is stunning. Um, so I've dropped a, a link to the Lemon Project blog in the chat, um, and also I'm seeing another question. Have you had any contact with descendants of the Bray School trustees or slaveholding families who sent children to the school? I know that I have not. Um, I'm Nicole, and I don't know about you, you've been working um, in this longer, and again, both on William Mary side and CW side. Right. So I have actually had some contact on the CW side with some of the descendants of trustees in particular. Um, I think it would be very interesting to bring them into conversation with the lab. I also know Dr. Johnson, because I don't want to take credit for his research, has done some work in identifying descendants of the Diggs family who later owned that extant building. So I think it's an ongoing conversation, much as descendants for those who were enslaved and attended the school. But I personally have had some contact with a few um, of them, but I'm not gonna again, I'm not gonna name them here because they have not given me permission to do so. Did we have any more questions? Um, I am not seeing anything. So um, unless someone wants to wants to dart up a final hand, um, I wonder if we're ready to start. Uh, oh, oh, there, there it go. is. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh no, it's an. I think is that Sharon? Is that a hand up or is that an applause? We'll take either one. <laughs> um, very bad at this. <laughs> stuff. Um, I did have a question. Um, I remember a few years ago, uh, long, well, maybe it's 10 years ago, um, archaeological work was done um, in the Mercer Square area. And what was discovered was a whole bunch of 18th century pencils. And uh, at that time, they thought, well, maybe this might be a site um, do you have any information about that? Do you, I know that was done on the CW side, so I can address that briefly, Sharon, if that's okay with everyone else with the lab. Um, so again, we will always defer to the preservation team and Jack Gary, who's currently doing distribution analyses on those slate on those slate okay. Sorry, I'll just mute you really quickly. Um, in addition to that, the, the research reports from that 2012 to 2014 archaeological excavation are not yet complete. So again, stay tuned on the preservation page for more information um, or reach out to Jack directly, as he mentioned this evening. But when it comes to what those slate pencils may potentially mean from an archaeological standpoint, um, that team is still working on distribution analysis, which I, I should explain that. Um, distribution analysis, for those of you who are not familiar within the archaeology world, almost works as a heat sensor map. So the idea is that you take 
let's say you want to look at two or three or one specific item. Let's say you see a lot of China from 1760 and you want to see, was it dumped on a site or is it clearly intentional in its placement? Distribution analysis allows you to do that and it almost serves as a heat map on the site to indicate, was it a trash pit or was it actually being used in some sort of logical human distribution? You can learn more about that, by the way, at Monticello and the Digital Archive for African Slavery, D-A-A-C-S. Well, thank you so much. And it was a pleasure always working with you. And it's so nice to talk with you again and all the people that are involved in this. And even though I'll be retiring soon, um, it has been, uh, this Ray School is a wonderful project, and thank you. Thank you. Well, we have at eight o'clock is the end, and that really was kind of that was the kind of the hard stop, the kind of the latest that we we could imagine kind of keep um, on the Zoom. If we have questions, comments, anything else that um, we want to say, maybe that will free us all who who are able to, whose schedules are allowing, um, to pivot to the CW program. I know that I'm going to be. Um, changing over to that program. I'm very, very intrigued to, to what um, that presentation holds for this evening. So if there's any, not anything else, I'm going to, on behalf of, if I can do that, on behalf of the Brace School Lab and the Office of Strategic Cultural, Cultural Partnerships, um, wish you a very good evening. Anne-Marie, did you want to say anything else as our liaison? Just to thank you, Maureen and Nicole and Margaret for all the efforts in putting this together. And also a shout out for all of you marvelous people who are caring, committed and connected to the broader Williamsburg Bray School project and the William and Mary Bray School lab. Marvelous seeing you all. And we're all hopeful of some time um, in the not too distant future when we can meet face to face. So until then, take very good care and enjoy the evening.